level of proof takes time and money. Music is the hardest copying of all to prove. Curtis Lugay is a composer who lives in London. He spent three years trying to bring a copyright action. He's convinced that his song, Inside Out, has been copied in a record that made the top 20 in 1992. I just felt, when I first heard it, I just felt a bit stunned, really. And after that, angry. He's based the entire song on the hook of um, our tune, Inside Out. And basically, he it up a bit. You know, it's got better production and what have you, but it's more or less the same. Curtis Lugay applied for legal aid to take action under the copyright law. But at first, he was turned down by the legal aid board. They weren't convinced of his case. He appealed and the decision was reversed. That's allowed him to pay for expert help from another composer from a very different world. And you can hear the similarity, surely. Here is Inside Out once again. I'm going to take all the rhythm out of it, just give you, as it were, the bones of the music. Inside Out. Here is the other song. Notice there's a slight difference insofar as the second song has a lead-in phrase. But the crucial phrase which people are liable to remember is, th is this. And that comes twice, and that's, to me, the same phrase. There's no evidence that Donny himself ever heard Curtis Lugay's song, but at the time, Donny was managed by a company called Jago Productions. And a year before Donny's hit, Curtis Lugay and his brother David were approached by a Jago employee to see if they had any new songs. He asked if I had any material, because they had uh, an artist there who was looking for a single. They, apparently they'd done some of the album, but they were still looking for, you know, a hit single. So I brought along a tape to him with ten tunes. He said he'd get back to me. One of those songs was Inside Out. Jago Productions never did get back. I would have liked some recognition for, for my work, basically. I just want people to know that, that I wrote the song. Uh, it's as simple as that. But they're denying it denying it all at the moment, so... I've never heard this guy song before. I don't know Curtis, I don't know, you know. All right, let's just play the two songs. Now we're coming on to your song. Mm -hmm. What is the difference? Mine's a better tune, man. Yours it may be a better tune, but they're the same tune, maybe better played. It's a whole it's the different same it's the whole, tune. It's, no, it's, it's, the whole, it's a whole different song. What do you mean a whole different song? That doesn't it's in the sound same like. Key, isn't it? It's the same key. Same it, key. Okay, it's the same key. It says. Same beats, it, same key, almost um, the same notes. It's not the same guy, man. I mean, it's just an extraordinary coincidence, isn't it? It's, it's just coincidence. Total coincidence. And the words were coincidence. Mm hmm And the fact that Jago management went to Curtis Lugay and got a tape of Inside Out, mm -hmm. and you produced a song that was similar in words and chorus after that, that's a coincidence as well. Mm -hmm. So we've got at least three coincidences here. Yeah, and if... And if for me... And some coincidence. Isn't yeah, there's a... There, I don't know. Mm. You know. Miracles happen, you know what I mean? Miracles, yeah. <laughs> I'm not being silly, but I mean, you're not psychic, are you? I'm not psychic, no. no. I, I just, you know, Curtis it's just... Lugan. I mean, it's just a vibe thing. 
you know? Something. Yeah, where, you know, you, you know, inspiration from heaven then <laughs> made me write. Like, makes the world go around. I can't sort of, you know, if I'd listened to Curtis's tune, I would have said, you know, well, actually, I've heard Curtis's tune, but I haven't. Curtis Lugay now spends his time helping East End kids with their music. If he can show his song was copied by Don E, he'll receive some of the considerable royalties a top 20 hit can make. But the dispute isn't really about money. The whole music business is built on reputation. And if you have one top 10 hits, then all of a sudden, you know, the phone starts to ring and people want to work with you and want to write with you. It's not just a hobby, it's, a, it, it's my life. Um, I've been doing it for over 15 years now, and it's a shame that that I should have a hit, you know, inverted commas, in this, in this way. It's just ridiculous. The pop world is full of songs that sound the same. As we've seen, proving they are the same and they've actually been copied is very difficult. Musicologists often differ. In one case where there was considerable disagreement, Professor Gardner was an expert witness. It involved a group called the Chiffons and a Beetle. My sweet Lord, mm, my Lord, mm, my Lord. He's so fine. Chiffons did da 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 ra da 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 param tam ra da da di da da da. There are rhythmic differences. Otherwise, it struck me as really being substantially the same song. An American judge agreed and ruled that George Harrison had copied the Chiffons. In America, he had to pay out over half a million dollars in damages. In Britain, he settled out of court. But it all took five years of legal wrangling and hundreds of thousands of pounds in lawyers' costs. Still, that hasn't deterred musicians from copyright disputes. On the contrary. Each week, the music press reads like a court report. The reason pop music is running out of tunes. It's deeply hurting because you realize that what you thought of is now making millions for someone who hasn't had the decency to say, look, I'd like to use our, your idea, let's go 50-50. That doesn't happen. But that would, that's the gentlemanly thing to do, isn't it? But then pop music has never been a gentlemanly business. One person who's very familiar with the cynical realities of the music world is writer Johnny Rogan, an expert in contemporary rock. Six years ago, he decided to write a book about one of Britain's most influential and controversial bands, The Smiths. I started off assuming that was going to take a year, and it ended up taking me four years. I was researching here in London, in Manchester, in Dublin, and spending a hell of a lot of time interviewing people. I interviewed something like 100 people for this book. Johnny Rogan doesn't like publishers' deadlines. He refuses fees in advance. Instead, he lives off the royalties from his nine previous books. What you're looking for is, is an ex exclusive information that has never come out before and whole new perspectives. Because most of the perspectives that you receive come through the press, they're regurgitated again and again and again. And my job has always been to find people to come up with new things because finding somebody that has, that has never spoken before on record is, is always a scoop. Oh yeah? Right. What can do for you then? Well, do you mind if I take... You're searching for a musician, you've got a lead. Somebody says, oh, they, they frequent the Bull and Gate. You walk in the door and it's a bit like high noon. Everybody looks around, they don't know you. Uh, they, they wonder why you're, you're there. He was, yeah, he could come in and there was a song just like that. You know. When you tell them you've come all the way up from London to, to talk to them, and you do it in a, in a polite enough way, I think they're probably quite flattered. The resulting book, Morrissey and Ma, the definitive story of the Smiths, was published in 1992 
It got very good reviews. Then in March last year, two years after publication, Johnny Rogan picked up a copy of the Sunday Times. In the magazine, there was a long article about Morrissey, which had complete sections remarkably similar to his book. I was quite amazed as I went through because the article had been written quite clearly, um, point by point, page by page from, from the book. You could systematically go through it paragraph by paragraph, and it was actually in chronological order as well to the page. I thought that was quite incredible. But the final and most disconcerting thing was that I discovered that my own prose had actually been plundered. There were sentences in there where my very own words were echoing back at me from the page. And that was where it went beyond the pale. That was actually genuine, flagrant plagiarism. And surprisingly, the writer who brought Johnny Rogan's words to three million people, without acknowledgement, was no beginner. She was Julie Birchall, one of the most highly paid columnists in the country. I was just genuinely baffled. I was baffled that, that a journalist of, of the standing and integrity of, of Julie Birchall would, would actually plagiarise stuff so, so blatantly, it seems to me. Johnny Rogan started legal action. After a year of negotiation, he accepted the Sunday Times offer of £5,000, but he had to split this with his publishers. And even though he was completely in the right, the legal system meant he had to pay some of his own costs. He ended up with just over £1,000, much less than the fee Julie Birchall received for writing the article. I thought, as natural justice went, I should get paid something equivalent of what Julie Birchall was paid. And it was then revealed that Julie Birchall had received a staggering £6,200 for writing the piece. Julie Birchall is a columnist who often takes a strong moral stand. So we offered her the opportunity to tell us exactly why she'd plagiarised Johnny Rogan's work. She faxed us her answer, no thanks. But why do people of proven creativity, like Julia Birchall, find the need to copy other artists' work? Well, it's probably laziness, and they think they can get away with it. Because not only is it hard to bring a case for breach of copyright, the penalties are usually pretty small. One person who was determined to ensure that his copyist paid the full penalty for stealing his work was Ray Gaffney. He's been a photographer for 20 years and has built up a wide range of prestigious clients. In September 1992, Ray Gaffney was asked by three women friends who run a small hat business if he could do them a special favour a Christmas card. Ray Gaffney agreed, and with his assistant, Colin Anthony, came up with the idea of a photo montage with the three women dressed as angels wrapped in silk. It took about a day to shoot. It involved about 200 shots. I mean, obviously, when you're photographing people that are meant to be flying through the air looking like angels, it's got to look right. Two months later, Ray Gaffney saw his photo again, but not on a Christmas card. It had been used without his permission and with no mention of his name as an ad in a design magazine. The ad had been placed by a company Ray Gaffney had never heard of, the Merry Hunt Corporation. They were promoting the silk the women were dressed in and had got the photo from them. I thought, cheeky so-and-sos. It's not even their picture. I um, got in touch with Merry Hunt and told them that I thought the, the ad was very nice, but it was actually my picture. Um, and don't they think they should have actually got my permission first? Um, they didn't seem to think they needed my permission. For the first time in his career, Ray Gaffney went to court. It seemed an open and shut case of copyright infringement. I did expect just one appearance with um, some arbitrator sitting there, deciding on what was the law, and that would be the end of it. Instead, I had six court appearances. Um, there seemed to be trivial little matters that were brought up that had to be decided in front of legal people. Um, it was this sort of general legal quagmire of just trying to complicate the issue and um, 
consume as much of my time as possible in the hope that I would just go away, I suppose. All it did was make me more determined. But it didn't do him any good. In March last year, Ray Gaffney won his case and was awarded his legal costs. But then Mary Hunt went into liquidation. And this meant that although Ray Gaffney had won, in practice, he was the loser. He was two and a half thousand pounds out of pocket. I think it's a tragedy that someone like Ray Gaffney, after 15 months, should have gone through this awful process at the, the county court and still not have obtained the cash that he's owed. It's an out-and-out -out case of copyright infringement, and it's appalling it's taken so long with such little result. Ray Gaffney is yet another victim of a culture in which respectable businesses feel free to copy someone else's work. They wouldn't dream of stealing your wallet, but neither would they flinch from running off with your idea. This matters because that's like stealing years of an artist's life, and the damage spreads far beyond the individual. It isn't just a question of taking photographs, it's a question of influence and creativity. We're not a country anymore of shipbuilding and tin mining and heavy industry. What we rely on, what we're very good at at present, is the intellectual side of creation. What we all have to do is to protect and nurture designers, filmmakers, musicians, writers, because they are the heritage of the future.